Good afternoon. Can you hear me all right? Great. I'm Kevin Gwinner. I'm the Dean of the College of Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our distinguished lecture series. We've, it's actually a lecture series that's the oldest lecture series in the college, and we've uh, not been able to have it for the last couple of years. So it's exciting to bring it back to campus um, now, that we're, uh, now that we feel safe being around each other um, today. So um, Commerce Bank and the William T. Kemper Foundation have collaborated with the college to sponsor this lecture series. It's in an effort to enhance the learning experience for our business students by providing them access to successful, high-achieving business executives. I want to introduce Mr. Sean Drew. Sean, if you wouldn't mind standing. He's the Market President and Chief Executive Officer for Commerce Bank in Manhattan. Thank you, Sean, for your generous partnership uh, that we enjoy with Commerce Bank and the William T. Kemper Foundation. I also want to uh, welcome Mr. Thomas Rafter, Assistant to Treasurer Rogers, from the Kansas State Office of the Treasurer. Um, so thank you for being with us today. It's my honor to introduce our distinguished lecturer this afternoon, Lynn Rogers. Lynn Rogers was sworn in as the 41st State Treasurer on January 4th of 2021. Lynn is a businessman, former state senator, former lieutenant governor, and former Wichita Board of Education president who has been helping Kansas families for decades. Lynn has more than 40 years of experience in banking, serving in a number of capacities for a variety of financial institutions. He spent more than 30 years traveling Kansas and as, as an agricultural banker, assisting farmers and ranchers with financial planning and investment. He worked to provide more than $750 million in leasing and financial services to farmers, ranchers, and grain cooperatives. Lynn is a leader who has a passion for education and improving the lives of Kansas families. He's lived in Wichita for over 30 years with his wife, Chris, and they have three adult children, Kyle, Kelsey, and Keegan. Please join me in giving a warm wildcat welcome to Kansas State Treasurer, Lynn Rogers. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, thank you. I've got a couple questions for you all before I get started. Um, how many have ever heard of the state treasurer of Kansas or any state treasurer position before? Be honest, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't know. Okay, that's better than most. Some of the group, groups that I'm in, they're kind of a little hesitant. Um, how many of you grew up in town or a city? All right, how many grew up on a farm? We got a few hands, okay. Um, how many grew up on a, near a town less than 750 people? All right, we've got a couple. Um, any of you grew up on hog farms? All right, we lost you there, sorry. <laughs> uh, my background, I grew up on a farm in eastern Nebraska. Um, I uh, had a very idyllic childhood. You know, we uh, didn't know really how poor we were. Um, but we love, I loved, you know, being able to, we, my first job was walking soybeans for 50 cents an hour. And uh, when Monsanto went with uh, Roundup Ready, uh, I lost that gig. That was gonna, not going to be my, my future plans for, for, uh, for business. But uh, went to the University of Nebraska with a business degree. And really didn't know what I wanted to do at that point in time, uh, but decided to move to Chicago. I didn't have a job, uh, but I knew some people that knew some people. And so I showed up uh, in downtown Chicago and got a job with uh, First Federal of Chicago with Savings and Loan, and ultimately it became part of Citibank and worked with them for a number of years. And, uh, and then about five years into that situation, I got recruited to come work for the farm credit system in Kansas. Um, I had not even heard of the town of Wichita uh, before in my life, and I ended up interviewing there. Uh, how many are acquainted with the Federal Land Bank, the Production Credit Association, or CoBank? Any, any ag folks that are out there? Okay, we got a few. Um, the, uh, the farm credit system uh, is a $150 billion organization. Uh, they're owned by the farmers and ranchers. It's what's called a cooperative. They uh, end up uh, loaning money to farmers and ranchers. Uh, during the 1930s, uh, that was when the Federal Land Bank was created. Nobody wanted to loan money to farmers for, for real estate. 
And so, uh, actually, let me take that back. It was 1916, 1917 was when the land bank was created. 1930s was the production credit, which was the operating loans. And that was also when the bank for cooperatives were, were started. When I started in the, the farm credit system, there were 150 uh, uh, farm credit banks, and there were uh, almost 100 and, or almost 1,000 farm credit associations. Today, there's three banks, and there's about 15 associations. So in that last 35 years, there's been an incredible amount of mergers and acquisitions, very similar to the commercial banking world. And so, uh, you know, that was one of the things that I've seen in my career in the last 30 years is how much change there's been. And it tells me that for the next 30 years, we're going to continue to see a lot of that change. I also work for, uh, with a credit union, and so a lot of different entities of the farm credit system. And a lot of people ask, how did I get to be the state treasurer, and why did I do that? Well, I loved being involved in my local community. Um, when I was a banker, I traveled Kansas, Oklahoma, Colorado, and New Mexico, and worked with farmers and ranchers. So if you see the big grain elevators, um, or the MKC elevator, grain elevators here in Manhattan, uh, those were some of my customers. The big spray rigs that they use in the field, I helped finance those. The grain facilities and the barns and the buildings, the same type of thing. And oftentimes with farmers, uh, part of my job was to help families uh, expand their business so that not just one generation could earn their keep, but they could be multiple generations. And so the next generation could come in. And that ends up being a very interesting process because you've got to make sure that it's uh, credit worthy, that they're willing to uh, sometimes make the sacrifices and, and build their business together. Multiple generations don't always get along. And so it puts a lot of extra risk on the banker. Uh, but I started very early in my kid's career in high school, or grade school, um, I volunteered at my very first PTO meeting, parent-teacher organization. And I said I'd help with the, with the, uh, the auction for, to raise money. Because so our schools were, again, underfunded at that point in time. And so I did that for a while, got involved in uh, the bond issue that we had in, in Wichita in the year 2000. And then I was asked to run for a school board position and really loved being on the school board. Some of you may have parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles that have been on the school board. That's one of the toughest jobs, elected official jobs in the country. Um, and it's gotten even harder you know, because of COVID. But uh, you know, our job was to make sure that schools and education and kids could succeed. And so we passed a couple bond issues. I served there for 16 and a half years. And some of those were the most enjoyable years of my life. Um, and my specialty was the budget. You know, we had a $650 million budget in the, in the school district, more than the city and the county. And so we wanted to make sure that we used those, those funds uh, correctly. I uh, never really had an intention to go to Topeka. That was never my desire. I kind of thought people in Topeka lived in a bubble. And, uh, and uh, once I got there, I kind of realized they did if they were in the capital. People act a little differently there than, than what most of us Kansans do. And so I, uh, but I ran for state senate because uh, I had a state senator who would never talk to us about public education. They were not willing to sit down and, and help us understand uh, you know, why they were cutting our budgets, why they weren't putting money into higher education, why they weren't doing those kinds of things. If you recall, again, that was much of the time during the Brownback tax experiment where we didn't have the state funds to do what we needed to do. Um, I served in that role for two years, and I was on the banking committee and uh, was on the, the Fed and State, which we call the Sin and Sorrow Committee. Um, you know, uh, guns or abortion. I mean, all those kinds of major things are covered in that. And then also the Agricultural Committee. And uh, one of the things that I really noticed when I became a state senator, um, you, those are, when you get elected to those kinds of things, they can really go to your head. Because, you know, as a state senator, I was one of only 1,000 people that have served in that role uh, as an elected official in that chamber since the state started uh, back in 1861. So that can get you to your, you know, make, make your ego go a little high. But when I walked in that door, and if you've been there, how many have been to the Capitol? Many of you probably went as, as younger kids. It's a beautiful building, half art museum, half history museum, 100% you know, capital. Um, you go through these big arched doors, uh, thick walls. Um, and I realized I knew a lot about agriculture. I knew a lot about banking. And I knew um, a lot about education. But there were a 1,000 other topics that I really didn't have a clue about. And so I had to depend on my other uh, legislators to help me with that. And that was very similar to what I found when I was in the banking world. Um, we had a team of, of people when we'd do a loan. Um, you know, I would get out, I was kind of the, 
the hunter, uh, and then the gatherer back in the office would do the credit analysis. Um, and I actually, my office for the leasing company, uh, Farm Credit Leasing in Wichita, those four states that I handled, all the home office was done in Minneapolis. So we, it was very remote, very early. I, I've been, I worked on a remote basis long before COVID. But uh, what we did was, you know, I would give them the credit information, they would crunch the numbers, uh, we would put the loan packages together, I'd run back out and get signatures and do all those kind of things. So, you know, I had to depend on, on credit people, I had to depend on uh, analysts, and same in the legislature. You know, I had to depend on my colleagues uh, in my caucus, uh, as well as other uh, committee members, to ask the right questions and to understand. And I think if there's one thing I can tell you, um, no matter what area of business that you go into, is to make sure that you work on relationships and networking and that people uh, will either make or break you in your career. And one of the things uh, that I've learned over the years is by you know, being a decent person, um, you can uh, earn a lot of respect and you can also get a lot of, I don't wanna call them favors, but people will work with you when they find that they like you and they want to, to help you succeed and you want to help them succeed. And that was part of my goal as a banker. All the, every business job that I had was what could I do to make them successful? Because if I didn't, one, I wasn't gonna get the deal. And if I didn't get the deal, that meant I didn't get the money. You know, my paycheck was gonna be affected. Um, and then in Topeka, what I learned is if I didn't help people succeed, I wasn't gonna get a whole lot of money. That wasn't the issue, but I could see, you know, success, uh, that happens throughout the state. You know, people uh, could improve their, their livelihoods, their families would be successful, they would be successful. So, you know, relationships and networking, um, even the people that you meet now, these are the, the, your classmates, um, your, your colleagues, your teachers, these are people that you can call on for your entire career. And you will come across them no matter where you're, where you're at. Um, I, as I said, went to the University of Nebraska and I was at a, a feed mill in uh, Russell, Kansas. How many are from Russell? Anybody from Russell? Near Russell. Anybody know where Russell is? So, okay, all right. Um, and here's one of my uh, college classmates. He runs the plant, and I did not know that. And so, you know, uh, that was, that's one of those things you never know when you're gonna run into somebody that, uh, that will be able to help you or you can help them. Um, so anyway, we got, I, I was senator for a couple years. I sat in the back row uh, by then Senator Kelly, and uh, I always tell the joke that she leaned over and asked if uh, what I was doing that summer, and uh, I said, well, nothing, and she said, well, do you wanna run for lieutenant governor while I run for governor? And I say, sure, what kind of trouble can that get me into? Um, little did I know that that would start, you know, a four-year process of traveling all over the state. I was just telling your dean, uh, when I became uh, treasurer in January of 2021, uh, up until election day, um, we spent over 65,000 miles on the road traveling throughout Kansas. Um, and many of you, if you're not from Manhattan, you know how far and, uh, and how many miles we have in the state. Uh, but I think it's really important that, that our elected officials get out and meet and be out in, in regular places of Kansas as much as we can. Um, so I became Lieutenant Governor and my task under those uh, two years when I was Lieutenant Governor was uh, to be what we call the Office of Rural Prosperity. And our job, my job was to help rural communities prosper. And one of the things we found out with our research very early was that when rural Kansas prospers, urban Kansas prospers. Um, there was a, a university study, Wichita State I believe, that showed you know, every 1% increase in, uh, in, in income for rural Kansas was a two to 3% increase for urban Kansas. So, um, so it's really to the benefit of folks that, like me that live in Wichita to see that our rural you know, communities prosper. And I also learned that there's a lot of jobs, a lot of opportunities for business, for engineering, for teachers, all over our state and in some really wonderful communities. So if you haven't considered staying in Kansas, let me be the first one to ask you, please stay in Kansas. We need you uh, wherever you're at, no matter what type of job that you're, that you're doing. But we learned from that uh, first summer, um, we, we listened, we did 12 um, uh, days of travel where we went out to different communities and talked to individuals. We did um, over uh, 200 different events uh, where we stopped and toured either factories, schools, um, we did you know, community get-togethers, uh, talking points, those kinds of things. We did a lot of listening. And what we heard was that people needed housing, they needed broadband, 
and they needed childcare. Those were three things that the state could help with, not answer the question and not do it, but still to, uh, uh, to do what we could to help provide benefits in that way. Fortunately, this last year in the legislature, um, we, we, well, the housing, we ended up turning that into the first statewide housing study that we did in 31 years. The last one was done during Joan Finney's years, and we did that on a county by county basis. We, the legislature responded by putting almost $100 million into rural and urban housing. And so uh, if you're a factory owner and you want to expand your business, but you have no place for them to live, uh, that's going to make it really difficult to expand your business. So same with, um, you know, if you want to start a business, if you don't have broadband, we've got to figure out a way to, to do that and expand that. And so uh, we did that as well. And uh, so we got to see some real benefits there. Then if you remember in 2020, in November, um, the state treasurer at the time, Jake LaTurner, got elected to Congress. And so he moved on and the governor had the ability to appoint. She asked me to provide her some names and I gave her a couple and she asked if I would do it. And you know, my first response was, no, I think I'm fine here. Um, but then I found out that part of my job as a state treasurer is I get to count $19 billion a year. And as an ex-teller of a bank, it was just too much fun to pass up, let me tell you. They don't let me near the cash vault, so you're safe. But, uh, but what I really found was that the things that we could do in the state treasurer's office could really affect and help an ordinary Kansan. Um, I found it very similar to the work that I did as a banker, uh, because if, if many people don't understand the services that a bank or a financial institution can provide, and oftentimes um, they're using the wrong product or they're using, using it the wrong way, and so it either comes back and bites them or, or they just don't get to reach their goals. And if, if you fit the wrong product with the wrong person, whether it's you know, uh, at Target or, or anywhere, you're gonna have dissatisfied customers. And what we found in the state treasurer's office, there was a lot of things that we were doing. Some of them were still based in 1980s uh, banking procedures. If you remember what those were, anybody that was there, it was basically if you wanted to make a loan payment, you had to write it down on a piece of paper, have it notarized, put the bank account in, and mail it in. And we were still taking bond payments from our cities and our counties and our school districts. So we upgraded that. Um, we had a bunch of outdated software systems um, that had a lot of personal information. Um, that was out of date and out of security measures. So we were able to upgrade and update those. Um, but then the other things that we saw too is that the things that people save for um, housing, education, and retirement. We had a great education program with the 529s. Maybe some of you are benefiting from that, from your parents opening those. Um, I would encourage you to make sure that when you're ready to have kids that you do the same type of thing for your kids or your nieces and nephews. Um, it's a great way to help make higher education much more affordable. We saw about a 33% increase on that because we started promoting it to the families and the people that could use it. So we, try, again, tried to match up the right people with the right thing. One of the other big things that we hit, uh, we, I took office in Treasurer in January of 2021. And if you remember what happened in February of 2021, of course, we were in the middle of COVID, but we had um, Storm Uri, the, the really low... Uh, temperatures and the high natural gas costs. Natural gas prices went from $2.49 to $660 a unit. And we had uh, a lot of cities, a lot of our natural gas people that provided the heat for cities all over the state that were facing bankruptcy because they could not afford those kinds of bills. And so the legislature responded with a loan program. Uh, we have never loaned money like that in the, in, in, at any point for the state but they put $100 million into this program and told me that I was supposed to implement it. And so the bill passed on a Wednesday. It became law on a Thursday uh, with the signing or putting it in the, the Kansas Register. And we had applications ready to go on Friday and money out the door by noon. And the reason we could do that was because of my banking background. We understood loan programs. We had lending documents in place, but we, 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 we scurried. We worked you know, around the, the, the clock but we did that because we knew that if we didn't, some of these cities were gonna to have to file bankruptcy. And if they filed bankruptcy, these cities would go away. And some of these cities were as small as 150 to 12,000 people. And so we knew that was gonna create a, a tremendous uh, a problem. So in a matter of uh, 72 hours, we loaned $80 million. 
And if I could have done that in my private banking world, I would have made my sales goals really, really fast. The only problem with it is we loaned those out at a very low spread, and so I would have not made my my uh, volume or my uh, my spread goals. So uh, so that's uh, that was one of the difficulties. But um, but as a treasurer, you know, you're the chief banking officer for the state. We manage the state bank accounts. Uh, we make sure that all the money that comes into every state agency comes in, it gets accounted for, and it gets moved over to our investment uh, part of the state, the, the pooled money investment board. Uh, we don't invest any money uh, ourselves. Uh, we, we make sure that the accounts are there and open and, and we can move them back and forth. And so as a state treasurer, I also serve on the pooled money investment board. And there it's a group of, of five individuals that manage, that oversee that to make sure that the money gets um, implemented and, and uh, uh, invested the right way. Most of those are going to be very short term investments so that when we need to pay teachers or we need to pay bonds or, or any type of big major state funds that we get those done. And then I also serve on the CAPERS board, which is a Kansas Public Employees Retirement Fund. And that's a $24 billion fund. It's one of 130 um, state-organized uh, uh, retirement funds. Um, you know, everything from uh, Ohio has two or three, Missouri has two or three different ones. Covers all the retirement for teachers, uh, first responders, and many local governments. And so we, I'm one of nine members of that board. Four are appointed by the governor, one by the speaker, one by the president of the Senate, uh, two are elected by, one by teachers, one by first responders, and then the state treasurer. And so we set the policy for CAPERS investments. We've had two really good years. This year is not quite so good if you've been following the market, but uh, we have our board meetings on this coming Thursday and Friday, so we'll learn a little bit more of what's there. But our job there is, as a fiduciary, um, is only to do what's best for the beneficiaries of, of the program. So even though I go in as an elected official, I have to put those responsibilities of an elected official to the side and say, what's best for that teacher, retired teacher in Atwood, Kansas, or Pratt, Kansas? Um, what, what, is, what am I going to do to make sure that we get the best investment for the least risk? So those are some of the, the decisions that we, we face. Um, I have a staff of about 30 people, everything from IT to, um, to our fiscal uh, services. Our fiscal services go in and balance the checking accounts each and every day. Um, we issue all the bonds for cities, counties, and school districts. And then um, we also have what's called an unclaimed property division. And maybe some of you have heard of the unclaimed property. This would be money that uh, has been misplaced for some reason. It could be a bank account. Um, it could be a final paycheck from a, a job. It could be like your last um, vacation pay of two or three hours that you didn't know were there. Um, it could be refunds from your university. Um, it could be a number of different things. We, we found 25,000 for Kansas State University uh, recently. Thomas actually found that. So, uh, um, and you'd think we could find Kansas State University, don't you? Uh, it's kind of surprising. We actually have money for several previous governors that, that I've called and said they have money too. One of the fun things about the job is giving away that money. Um, I called a business in Fort Scott. I had to call them eight times before they finally realized that I was not a scammer, um, I was actually trying to give them money. So, um, and I'm telling you all this because you may have money there yourself. And so you can go into our website, it's the word Kansas, the word cash.ks.gov, so kansascash.ks.gov, and if you plug it into your browser on your phone and are looking down, that's not gonna offend me during this speech. So, uh, but you just plug your name in and see if it's available. And if it is, we want to get that back to you. Um, it's really important. It's not our money for the state, so it belongs to you. You might also find some money for your parents or your grandparents. Wouldn't hurt you to call them and say, hey, mom, I found you some money. You think I'm only tart costing you money here at K-State, but I'm getting you some money. And we've had some interesting cases. Um, I was in Lyons, Kansas. Anybody from Lyons? That's near Inman and, and Hutchinson. Uh, older gentleman came in. Um, we didn't have anything for him, and he said, look up my wife. She died a few years ago. $300,000 of life insurance policies that he did not know existed. Um, we've returned $5 million for a group of doctors in uh, Johnson County. They didn't know they had it missing, and uh, the company that was holding it for them 
they were, that company was already still charging them premiums for another policy during that same period of time. So we never quite understood how they didn't find them, but we found them right away. So, so that's part of our job is to get rid of, to get that money back to people. We have about $400 million in that regard that we wanna, wanna make sure uh, gets back to everybody in that regard. And then we have um, some, what we call linked deposit accounts. We have a $60 million fund for, um, for agriculture that we can loan out to commercial banks. We have, and if so, if a bank needs additional funding, they don't have enough deposits to, to borrow, they can borrow from us. And uh, we have one for housing. We've never made a loan uh, on the housing program. We're, we're working on that right now. And then um, we have a couple others that are just for, for uh, tax identity or tax uh, entities. Um, Thomas, what else am I missing? I'm trying to remember. Able oh, ABLE, yes. Uh, one of the other things we discovered, um, if you're a Kansan that's living with a disability, um, if you're getting Social Security, if you have a, a sibling or a, a, a parent, if they're on Social Security or Medicare, um, they can only save $2,000 in a savings account. And if they save more than that, they lose their eligibility. Well, the ABLE account was created back in 2014 to allow those individuals to save up to $100,000 without losing their eligibility. We came in in January and uh, found out a couple months later that the, the Trump administration had updated the, the uh, guidelines of who could qualify. Under Kansas law, it was, you had to have a conservatorship or um, you, know, you had to do th legal work to make sure that you could set somebody up to manage that account for you. Uh, the Trump administration changed it so that it uh, allowed a parent, a grandparent, or a sibling to open those accounts, which made it a lot easier, a lot more cost effective. The problem with that is state law didn't allow us to do that. We couldn't just implement it. So we had to go to the legislature and get a bill passed for both the House and the Senate and the governor to sign it so that we could get that done. And we, we were very fortunate, it was very uh, bipartisan. I think 118 to three on the House and 39 to nothing in the Senate, and then the governor signed it right away. And so we now offer that. Uh, so if you've got a family member that needs to put some money aside, uh, to save, and again, if you think about it, if someone is hard of hearing and they've got uh, need to get a new hearing aid, those hearing aids can cost six to eight thousand dollars. You can't save enough to ever buy one, and so what happens is those people end up, you know, using state aid, welfare, and whatnot. Whereas if people can save for themselves over a period of time, uh, they can prepare for their future and also some additional dignity. So, so that's another big program that we offer um, that we see as a, as a real benefit. Um, just so that you're all aware, I will not be treasurer after January. I was defeated uh, last uh, Tuesday. Uh, so there'll be a new individual that'll come in. Um, so many of the things that I talked about in the campaign won't happen, but I do know that uh, the state will go on. We're working with the, uh, the, the winner, Stephen Johnson, uh, to make sure that we transition as seamlessly as we can so that we'll be meeting with him after Thanksgiving to make sure that gets done. And, and I really wish him the most success because I know that when he's successful, the people that have worked for me you know, will be successful as well. And that'd be the other thing that I'd, I'd leave you as you work with people. Um, I had a boss when I was in Chicago at Citibank and uh, George Nikolai. And he had an interesting philosophy that he wanted to be as nice to people on the way up the ladder so that when he goes down the ladder and they go over him, that they would remember him and treat him well. And so it always was kind of a rule in my mind is that you know, when you're nice to people, uh, you know, sometimes you get stabbed in the back, but for the most part, it does come back and, and pay you in the, in the long run. And I have to say, in all of the different financial institutions, organizations that I've been in, um, the, the, even in the political world, uh, whether it's school board or state senate or, or the governor's office, um, you know, I have met some incredible people and I have been in some incredible uh, situations. Uh, things that, you know, I think back of being a, a kid that grew up on a, a farm whose job was to water and, and feed the pigs every morning before school. Um, you know, it just, it's a little heady to tell you the truth. Um, you know, it's like, how can I be in this boat? And so, you know, I hope that same thing happens to you as well, that no matter what, where you start, uh, that where you finish, uh, you'll be able to look back over 40 years. And 40 years goes very fast, people. Um, I can't tell you how fast. I, I don't think I'm 64, but I am. Uh, you guys can debate that later. No, I'm just teasing. But you know, it, it's one of those things that you, know, you keep your goals in mind, keep track of where you're wanting to be and what you wanna do. 
uh, and, and remember that time does fly fast and anything that, that you can do to, uh, to improve the lives of others you know, ultimately comes back and, and improves your life as well. So um, I think we're a little ahead. If there's questions, um, they may generate maybe more things for me to say. It, I think you can come down and, and ask a question here anytime. Just feel free. Um, I think it's on now. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Rogers. I'm Shayla. I'm a junior in finance. And earlier you kind of mentioned something that piqued an interest in me. Um, brain drain is the immigration of highly intelligent and skilled people from their home country. And you kind of emphasize like stay in Kansas. We need skilled people for engineers or what it be. And I know myself and many other undergraduate students are planning on leaving Kansas post-grad. So can you talk about how this migration of um, educated individuals has maybe affected the Kansan economy on a political standpoint or from a treasury point of view, and maybe what could be done um, at the Capitol to kind of help defend that and really, I guess, um, increase economic development of Kansas? Okay. Um, yeah, the, the question of how do we keep people here, how do we, what kind of impact it makes, I mean, just the fact that, um, you know, one of our students that goes from one of our schools, kindergarten through 12th grade, you know, we spend about $150,000 of tax dollars on their education. And when they leave, that doesn't include what gets spent, you know, here at a higher education. So you think of that $150,000 when it's gone, that's a huge investment that the state makes in our young people. And, uh, and if we're not realizing how important it is to keep them, uh, that's our loss. That's not on you. That's on, on us as the adults in the room. And so we need to do what we can to keep and encourage. Uh, one of the things I found as lieutenant governor, I often found in many of our rural communities, uh, people that, you know, they had positions open for bankers, for agronomy, for uh, engineers, for uh, business graduates, you know, for the co-op manager was much more, and, and a, a grain trader. I mean, there's folks that are, are, are trading securities that way. Um, and the local high school wasn't connected with those businesses, did not know that those jobs even existed in that county. And they real, could realize when we, they started talking about it that they need to do a better job of, of making sure when somebody leaves their, their hometown that they're encouraged to come back and stay there. Uh, there's a town in, in southeastern Kansas that that's their job. They track when their high school grads go to wherever they go to higher ed and follow them during their four years to make sure that they know that it, when they come close to the end that they're in, encouraged to come back and that these jobs are open. I'd like to see more communities do that. I think that's a big thing. We have some tax programs where, you know, going into certain counties, um, you can either get help for housing, um, for paying off your student loans, for uh, paying down some of your uh, different, uh, or even a tax break for some of those, uh, some RAWS uh, rural opportunity zones. So again, check with some of those counties on those. You know, if you get an identical offer, you, you can maybe play one county or one city off, off of another. So those are some of the things, but I think part of it also is listening. Um, you know, realizing that we've got to hear and talk to you know, young people all the time to make sure that we're finding out why are you leaving. And, and I left, you know, I, I moved to Chicago, Illinois without a job. Um, it was big, bright city. Um, you know, I again got off the, the train and wondered uh, what all these tall buildings were. I mean, I really had never been in a city with any building more than 10, 10 stories. And you know, these were hundreds of stories. And, uh, but I came back home, not quite Nebraska, but, but close. And uh, you know, now I've, I have kids, one's a, an attorney in Oklahoma City and one's a teacher in Kansas City. I'd love for him to come back to Kansas. It's gonna be tough uh, because of, of, of things, but we're not giving up you know, in that regard. And, and I think that's the thing too, is, is oftentimes, you know, I don't discourage anybody from going away to, to get that experience because of, of a bigger city, but I do like to remind people that anything that those bigger cities offer, we can offer those in, in many similar ways, maybe at a slower pace, you know, when we first moved to Wichita, I had to take my watch off for six months because the pace in Wichita was so much slower than Chicago. And now I wouldn't go back. I mean, uh, it just, it's, 
it's where we were able to raise our family and, and have you know, really good things. So, but good question. I think that's something, and as the, even those of you that are leaving, um, make sure you, you let leaders know, you know why you're leaving and what it would take to get you back. I think there's, there's nothing wrong with that as well. So, good. Any other questions? Feel free to come on up if you if you have one. Hi, name's my name's Alex Depaz. I'm a sophomore studying finance, and okay. kind of just piggyback on uh, education. What are some of the things that Kansas is doing to help uh, promote higher education or help funding in those areas, as they have a very um, little to no fun I mean, little funding. Yeah, I, I know one of the things that's been happening, um, the Department of Commerce and David Toland, who's the new uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, we've been, they've just, and Governor Kelly has just started some apprenticeships, internships, and um, you know, advanced uh, training so that uh, many people can get exposed to things that, that haven't, that they haven't been able to do it. Um, and so I think there's gonna be some more emphasis on that. A uh, number of our regents institutions too are looking at what they can do for some free tuition on different things. Um, you know, there's there's been a lot of mergers with banks. You know, when I I don't I don't do you even know how many banks are left in Kansas? I mean, you look at on a national basis. Uh, you know, there used to be a lot more uh, home office type jobs, uh, but they've they've switched now where they're much more people oriented. Um, and, and so there are certain types of levels that can only be done at a headquarters bank or, or financial organization, but there's still quite a few of those, particularly in the Kansas City market, investment firms and, and things of that nature. I, I would say uh, the state is doing better, but it, we still have a long ways to go. Um, I do think a lot of the leaders have realized that we, we are losing a lot of people. It was an issue that came up in the, in the, in the governor's race this last election. Uh, I don't think... You know, there was a lot of new ideas generated, but, um, but again, that would be one of the things I would encourage you to, is that whether you're registered here in Manhattan or you're registered at home, make sure that you talk with your elected officials, your state senators, your state representatives, and, and tell them what you're thinking. You don't have to agree with them. They don't have to be a member of your same party, but they do represent you when they get to Topeka in January. And so um, I often found uh, when I was a senator, you know, there was so much that I didn't understand on certain topics, and I would try to call people in my district to find out what they thought. Um, and I've encouraged that, like with the Young Bankers Association, when I've talked with them, what I've told them is go to that uh, organization, that uh, senator, uh, even if they're not on the banking committee, uh, make a relationship with them and talk to them and tell them what, what you need and what you want. Um, it doesn't have to even be a political topic. It can be, how do I improve my uh, future? You know, how do I keep Kansans here? You know, those are things that I think they would very welcome listening to. They may not have an answer. You may not have an answer, but you could start creating that dialogue. I don't think I answered your question very well, but um, I kept talking anyway, so sorry. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I do sense that the intent of most of the folks in Topeka want to do what's good for Kansans and young people. Um, but one of the things I noticed when I was in the Senate, um, our youngest member was 40. And um, I think now we have a, a 28 or, or early 30s, but we do need younger people involved in that. And we have younger folks over in the House, and they, they add a whole different level. Um, you know, old white guys like me have a different, have a certain perspective. And what we have to realize is that there's a whole lot of other perspectives out there that we need to listen to. Other questions? Then I might throw one out if, as he's coming up to the mic. So just to piggyback a little bit on what you were just saying, you, you mentioned earlier that the school board is one of the toughest uh, elected positions in the, in the, anywhere in the nation probably. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, you've obviously had a, 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 a long career in, in public service. What would you say to, to some of the young people here today that um, about getting involved in public service, and um, you know, what, do you encourage them to do that? Do you not encourage them to do that? How do, we need good people, right? Yeah, we do. And and I I don't look at an age um, as as a detriment. A younger person, uh, school board, city council are nonpartisan. 
Um, I hope we keep them that way because I think it's, it, if we only pick on an R or a D, we're going to lose really good people. But, um, but, you know, school board, even if you're single and don't have kids, you know, it's not a position where you have to, to, do, to have those things in order to qualify. You know, if you jump in or willing to do the work, and that's really the key, is that these aren't positions that are uh, just to pad your resume, they're work. I would spend uh, 30 to 40 hours a week on school board business besides my 40 hours a week, week or more at the office. Uh, when I was president, I think seven out of those 16 years, uh, it was closer to 60 hours because you did a lot of agenda planning. But you know, our budget was 300 pages, and so a lot of reading and a lot of information. But again, you can add that perspective. And having, uh, I think the youngest school board member ever in the state was elected at age 18. Um, he was in high school when he got elected, and I believe down in Hayesville. It's been a number of years ago. But yeah, I would say definitely step up and, 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 uh, and if not that, ask to, if there are committees um, or boards that you can serve on, you know, the library board or, or those kinds of things. Learn how it works from the inside. You know, how does the, and, you know, and again, from my background on finance and, and uh, uh, business, uh, my degree was in finance, and, and it was, and I would have to say, probably would need to go back to school to learn a lot more about finance because you've done, there's so much that's happened in the last 40 years. But um, learning that budget, um, that's where businesses, that's where everybody, business or a, 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 a government entity, sets their priorities. You know, what they spend on is what they think is important. So um, if you understand that and learn that, I think that gives you the ability to, to there'll be a lot of adults you know, I saw many times on school board, they didn't read the packet of information until they got to the meeting. And, you know, that's not a very effective way to, to be a leader. So, we got a question over here. My, name, my name's Josh. Uh, I'm a junior studying finance. You kind of touched on the market downturn earlier. And I was just curious to know, just, you know, from the state's perspective, what specifically you guys work on or think about during economic downturn, or maybe how do you work with, you know, national government to kind of fight that okay. um, during just, you know, slow down periods? Well, I'll, uh, I'll answer that a couple different ways. One is under the pooled money investment board, the market changes have actually been good for the state. Um, when we invest money for the, for the state idle funds, and that's what the PMIB does, um, those are monies that most of the time will be spent in 30 to 90 days. So we don't have a very long time to invest them. And so the higher interest rates have actually helped us um, you know, we were making about a million dollars a year on that, and when interest rates rise, you know, we've made as much as 60 million a year, you know, on the idle cash. So that's, that's a good thing. On the capers, it's a different issue, um, but we work with a group of investment um, consultants. Uh, we have our whole team of investment managers, and their job is to, to you know, invest in private equities, um, you, know, uh, you know, the capital markets, all those kinds of things. But we also have a, a number of consultants, some on real estate, you know, whatever the, the investment is. And then their job is to help us determine what do we think is the, the uh, market, what, what, what should we uh, make. And so like right now, I think our current estimate this year, what they're telling us is that we will probably lose about 7% of our portfolio. Um, and so then the investment managers of the capers, their job is to beat that. And right now we're at, I think, a negative 3%. At least that was last summer. So uh, that's bad, 3% loss, but it's better than a 7% loss. So if we can beat the market, so to speak, we feel like that extra you know, 4% saved us ex extra dollars. And so uh, we do look at some of that. We look at the country risk. Um, you know, and there's a lot of controversy. There's even some in this campaign about ESG, if you've been hearing about uh, environment, social, and, and governance. And I look at ESG as something that really is a, um, it's a risk management tool. You know, as a, as a trustee, I want to make sure that we get the highest return for the lowest risk. And so I need answers to some of those questions to know what risks these companies are facing. And are they addressing them and not just sweeping them under the rug? And it doesn't matter whether it's, it's climate for the environment, uh, but it could also be governance. Do they have a board of directors that looks like the market that they're trying to, to reach? Um, the uh, social, are they being a good corporate citizen by cooperating you know, and doing what they need to do to encourage their employees and paying their employees right? Those kinds of things. So I see that ESG is really a good thing. Um, now, 
once you decide you're going to invest one way or the other, that's what I would call social uh, market you know, investing. Um, everybody does that. And that's what's funny is the people that are, are so anti-ESG are wanting us to not invest here or there. And it's like, but they've, they've decided what is, shouldn't be there. They're, that's the same thing that they're, they're claiming against. And what's interesting, particularly when you talk about climate in Kansas, where that ESG stuff is coming from either uh, a lot of it's from either Texas or from uh, West Virginia. West Virginia is very coal oriented. The treasurer there is the one that's made a lot of the noise. Um, you know, that's a very important industry for them. In Kansas, when you look at our energy needs, we're half renewable and half oil and, and gas. And so, you know, we want both of those industries to succeed and they both affect us, you know, from a tax standpoint, a job standpoint. And so we don't really want to see either one, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, disadvantages from that standpoint. So, so I think we're a little bit different in that regard than uh, what we'd have elsewhere. So, good. Hey, my name my name's Jacob, uh, and I was just wondering that uh, I know I was a little disappointed in the recent uh, outcome election, um, and, and I just wanted to know what your uh, future plans were. Oh, what my plans are? Yeah. Um, thank you. I was disappointed too, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Uh, you know, we did everything we could. You know, our analysis really showed that our Democratic base did not show up, and uh, the Republicans did, uh, but that is what, you know, made, made a big difference. And then a lot of the Republicans uh, went home, is how I describe it. They, they may have voted for Governor Kelly and then voted for, uh, for all the other Republicans, uh, which kind of a typical, typical thing. And I'm a former Republican, so I was a Republican up until I ran for the Senate. Um, and it really isn't about partisanship. I've always said this office is really one that needs to be competent and, uh, and all. Uh, at this point, I don't know. Um, I've had a couple offers. Um, my wife is scared to death that I'll be home full time. Uh, and you know, we've had an apartment in Topeka, and, and so when she's sick of me, she can send me to Topeka. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll be closing out the office and, the, and, the, and all of that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm too young to totally retire. I did retire from the bank that I was in for 31 years, and so um, we'll, we'll kind of see, see what happens. Um, you know, one of the big concerns just as, you know, it's for any ordinary person is what are we gonna do for healthcare? You know, I was just looking at, at you know, if we could buy the COBRA, you know, it's, it's about $1,200 a month to, to have that healthcare. And that's reasonable for, compared to some, uh, but for a lot of people, uh, you know, my age, that's a big issue that, you know, keeps people uh, deciding what they're going to do. So, um, so I'm hopeful. You know, I, I don't plan to run again for anything, um, but I do I want to contribute, you know, in some way, shape, and form. Uh, but we'll probably do that most likely from, from Wichita. So. Well, will you all join me in thanking Treasurer Rogers for his remarks this afternoon? Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. We have a, uh, oh. a token of appreciation we'd like to present to you. Thank you. Lynn, and uh, thank you so much for, for coming to campus. Great. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I'll be around if anybody wants to ask any more questions. So, great. If anyone has other questions, then you're welcome to come down and, and uh, meet Mr. Rogers as well. I'll take my mic off.